You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 469. It is the great arrogance of the present to forget the intelligence of the past. Ken Burns. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Indie Film Hustle's Filmmaker Process. We provide filmmakers with professional services to get their films or series funded, finished, and distributed. Some of the services we offer are pitch deck creation, film budgets and schedules, domestic and international sales estimates, legal contract templates, consulting, post-production services, script coverage, professional trailer editing, poster design, film deliverables, and production payroll. To learn more, go to www.filmmakerprocess.com. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films. From predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them, the odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. Well, guys, today you're in for a treat. We have award-winning documentarian Lynn Novick, who is the co-director, along with Ken Burns, of the new PBS limited series, Hemingway. Now, Lynn has been directing and producing landmark documentary films about American life and cultures, history, politics, sports, art, architecture, literature, and so many more for over 30 years. She has produced 80 hours of acclaimed PBS programming and has collaborated with Ken Burns on series like The Vietnam War, Baseball, Jazz, Frank Lloyd Wright, The War, and Prohibition. These series have garnered 19 Emmy nomination, and she is one of the most respected documentary filmmakers and storytellers in America today. I had an absolute ball getting into the weeds of documentary filmmaking, and we discussed not only the amazing new series Hemingway, but also her other project, College Behind Bars, which was her first solo directing project, and much, much more. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Lynn Novick. I'd like to welcome to the show, Lynn Novick. How are you doing, Lynn? Great. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for being on the show. I am a, a big fan of, uh, of your work. I've seen many of your documentaries over the years. I have gifted many of your documentaries, especially okay. to, to my father who just devoured baseball uh, <laughs> and other things like that and jazz. I know you were part of those projects with Ken yeah. uh, as well. So, uh, and I'm dying to ask you how the hell you do these things. <laughs> so <laughs> before we get started, how did you get into the business? How did you get into being a filmmaker? Yeah, sure. Well, first, before I get started, thank you for having me. I'm a little bit self-conscious because I had some dental work and I am missing a tooth. And so anyway, I ask your forgiveness about that, but it's a temporary situation. So there you are. And and there (laughs) it is. And look, in the the world that we live in, a missing tooth is very low on the priority list of things that could happen to you. Yeah. Be uh, phone ringing. <laughs> Sorry about good. that. I, I have good. the ringer off. I don't know why it rang. I'm going to just put it on airplane mode. And so sure. Do it. Okay. So anyway, um, in, the, in, yeah. in, the, in the grand scheme of things, the way the world is working, a little bit of dental work <laughs> is, the, I, I'll take that over yeah. the worst things that could happen to you in today's world. So. Oh, for sure. Especially nowadays. My goodness. Yeah. Exactly. It's a minor nothing. Yeah. Exactly. So um, how did you, so how did case, you get in? Yeah. 
So, you know, I was, I would say if I look back on my trajectory, such as it is now, it didn't, wasn't clear to me when I was first starting out. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I got out of college. I was very kind of lost. And I actually saw a number of documentaries, both on PBS and in the movie theater back in those days. This was in the mid 80s that made me think, wow, you know, I don't really know what I want to do with my life. I might go to law school or maybe I'm going to be a professor. I really didn't know. And I just was so transfixed by the power of storytelling true stories on a big screen based on history and things that really happened. And I love photography and I loved history and I, I just thought maybe I could do that. No idea how or what it would involve. And you know, if a film is well made, you really don't see the effort. It's like the swan going along and you're just gliding on the water, but you don't see the feet doing all this below the surface. So I had no clue what was involved in making a documentary or how challenging it can be or how rewarding, but I just naively thought I'd like to do that. And I actually applied to film school and I got in, and this was in the mid 1980s. There weren't many programs or I couldn't find any that taught documentary filmmaking. They were all narrative scripted based. And so I decided not to go to film school because I didn't think I had the imagination, frankly, to make up stories and to tell them on the big screen. And I really wanted to tell true stories. So I decided to apprentice myself if I could. And I really did go through kind of an apprenticeship starting at the PBS station in New York City, WNET, for six months. And then I worked for Bill Moyers on a series of programs that he was doing at the time. And then I freelanced for a while. And I kind of each job I had, I learned a little bit more about the process and different pieces of it that I could sort of master. So archival research, filming interviews, um, organizing material, writing a script, you know, different aspects of what kind of goes into any particular film. And luckily for me, I did hear that this filmmaker named Ken Burns was working on a film about the Civil War. And I thought, wow, that, that's my dream job. And I managed to meet someone who knew someone who knew someone who knew Ken and literally was so lucky that somebody quit as he was finishing the film. And um, he really needed someone to come in and help finish up the sort of administrative licensing process for all the pictures they used. So I just walked in the door at the right time. I had enough experience to do the job he needed done. And when we finished that, I was looking for another job. I only had a six month job when I first came. And he said, oh, wait, don't leave. I'm going to do this series on baseball and you should stay and produce it. Wow. And that was for me jumping off the high diving board. I had never produced a series. <laughs> Let alone I, I, baseball. I didn't know which, anything about baseball. <laughs> so, what is it, like a 38-hour? <laughs> something like that. <laughs> it's, 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 well, he and I were joking the other day because the original proposal he told me was five hours. It turned out to be 18. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> so so, so when, you work, when you work with Bill, uh, Bill Moyer, did you work on uh, Power of Myth? I did. Oh, my gosh. You worked yeah. with Joseph, so you were there with Joseph Campbell and worked well, – not, not there, I, but – I wasn't there actually when I came onto the project, and this is a series of interviews with this incredible philosopher, Joseph Campbell, about the power of myth in different cultures and how there's, we tell the same stories in different cultures, whether the Aztecs or the Greeks or, you know, the Norse gods. He found these incredible patterns of kind of the human journey. He had passed away um, uh, before I came on the project. He was quite yeah. elderly when Bill started interviewing him. So they were organizing the material. And my job was to find the visuals. So if he oh. mentioned the Aztec ball game, I had to figure out what are we going to show. Or if he mentioned, you know, Star Wars, uh, the Wayne and the, you know, the Holy Grail, we had to find stained glass that could show sort of he, he, he covered such a wide range of topics. And I was in those days sending snail mail letters to the far flung corners of the earth trying to get <laughs> images to show. Right. And I'm assuming, how, how did you get the licensing? Well, I guess the licensing for Star Wars was pretty easy because uh, well, you could just start, talk to George. <laughs> That's what Bill did. Exactly. So the Star Wars, right. So George Lucas was hugely influenced by these works and this writer. And so that is how the project, I believe, got started, that Bill Moyers and George Lucas basically agreed that Bill would do the interviews of Joseph Campbell and they had them at Skywalker Ranch. And then George Lucas let them use the footage, I believe, for you know some nominal fee. So that that was the organizing principle. And I have to say, when we were working on it, I did not realize how popular it would be. I thought to myself, what did I know? Who's going to want to listen to some old guy talk about the Aztec ball game and Hercules and whatever? And it was huge. It was huge. It was, so it was really, it was a wonderful experience to see that people really responded to it. 
Oh, no, absolutely. And I actually saw years later, uh, Bill did an interview with George Lucas on the power of myth on just George uh. Lucas's version of that. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, I remember watching as well. No, I was a huge fan of that. I mean, I've seen that Power of Myth thing a thousand times. It's just <laughs> so awesome. And any filmmaker, any filmmaker listening today should absolutely watch that. Because also the narrative structure that he talks about is involved sometimes in documentary in documentary yes. work as well. Just the the because that's life. That's what the myth is. Right. It's life. And all our lives have the call to adventure, the refusal. Yes. I don't want to go take that new job in, in New York. You know, I live right. in Kansas, you know, I'm scared, but then I go and the adventures and the tricksters and that's life. So it is really, really powerful. That's why I think why it's so popular. I agree. And I, I was just very naive and, and I just didn't appreciate <laughs> the power of what Joseph Campbell had to say and how it touched that deep nerve in people of trying to find meaning, trying to understand our human condition in the moment we're in and how it resonates with what happened to people in the past, you know, had these same questions that we have. It was, it was, um, I should go back and watch it again. Cause I think it also does have some storytelling lessons for, you know, how to put the pieces together so that the story unfolds in the way that people can watch it. So i am always been fascinated because when you and Ken go down this road, um, to make a, just, uh, just ridiculous, I mean, 18 hours. I mean, they, they're, oh, ab- they're obscene. They're obscene how long, jazz, how long was jazz? Jazz was like 10 hours, eight hours. I think like it that. was more like 20 because it was 10 parts. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So you had that going on. So how do you start a project like that? Mm. Like, how do you, you're not just covering, like Hemingway is a fairly large, we'll talk about your latest project in a minute. Hemingway is a man's life. I know you guys did Mark, right. I mean, I'm not sure if you did, but I know Ken did Mark Twain and right. and, and you had Frank, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's poster in the background. So those are specific peoples and lives. And that's pretty extensive. But when you tackle a concept like baseball mm. or jazz, like the obscene amount of knowledge that you have to comb through, how do you start a project like that? Yeah, I find the beginnings of projects probably the most terrifying. <laughs> Because you don't, at least for me, I usually don't know that much about it. So Mm -hmm. I have a huge amount to learn. And then to figure out, well, how does this fit into uh, something that could be on television people would want to watch? And, you know, I have to say that one of the critical ways that we go about doing this is in collaboration with other people. So our writer, Jeff Ward, who Ken has worked with for longer than I've worked with Ken, he wrote the Civil War script and several other scripts before that. And he wrote Baseball and Jazz and all the other films Ken and I have made together. So he dives into the deep end of the pool. Also, we order a lot of books. We start to read them. We start to take notes. We start to make outlines. And then we also figure out who are the smart people who are experts in whatever subject it happens to be. Who are they and can they help us? So when the history of jazz, it was when Marsalis, you know, we went to see him early in the process and said, will you help us? And he said, yes. And then he said, here's the, 10 people you should talk to, here are the 20 books you should read. And that led to other people. So we build a kind of a team of people who really keep us on the straight and narrow in terms of what's important to include and what we don't have to include and, you know, how to understand the big picture that we're trying to tell. So the start is hard. And I'm assuming though, as you're going through this process that let's say you have a structured outline and then all of a sudden you read a new book or you hear something new from a new interview and you're like, oh God, Everything's got to be shifted. We got to insert this here now. Yeah. Now everything's been all, re- and I'm assuming that's a constant. It doesn't happen once in a project. It happens constantly because you discover new things in your archival or archaeology, uh, archaeological yes. dig that you're going yes. through. Yes, and once the word goes out that we're working on something, people Everything. are always sending us stuff, which is so great. So the worst thing that can happen is after the film is done, <laughs> and then some does that happen? Thing, Has of that course, happened? every project. Yes, of course, and it's just you sort of just feel, oh, I wish I knew about that two years ago, but what can you do? So, you know, but we don't try to be the last word. So new material is always coming out about every subject and someone else can take up the baton and continue telling that story in some other way. And, you know, that's fine with baseball. One of the challenges was there, you know, there's so much, there's more to now, but there wasn't a lot of serious academic historical scholarship on the topic. Frankly, there were, you know, history of the Boston Red Sox or biography of Babe Ruth or, you know, something about baseball and the Black Sox scandal. But there wasn't really a big shelf of serious kind of academic historical work. 
So we really had to find historians who knew American history and happened to be baseball fans. And they could help us kind of get this in the context because we weren't just doing a sports show. We really wanted it to be about the story of America through the lens of baseball. Right. And like I, I watched Nash, the National Parks one it was oh because I'm a big, huge National Parks fan. And that's actually kind of my dream project as well, because you guys got to travel to every single national yeah, park. I didn't work on that, but I, that, I know it, it was basically an invitation to go to all those incredible places. Oh, it, amazing. It must have been a rough job. Like, oh, OK, we got to go to Yellowstone again. Oh, we got to exactly. go. We got to go to Yosemite <laughs> again, you know. Um, but those and that's another thing that you guys get to do. And sometimes, obviously, depending on the on the on the uh, topic, but you get to meet some of the most interesting mm-hmm. human beings who've ever lived, you know, and, and you're talking to people who either know a lot about a subject or are part of the subject. Like mm-hmm. you said, in, ja- in jazz with uh, Marcellus, he, he's like a living legend. So to talk mm-hmm. to someone like that, I mean, that must be amazing as a documentarian to be able to talk to, you're talking to history essentially. Yeah. That's one of the best parts of my job. I would say is the chance to meet and get to know people really spend time with them and hear their stories. And, you know, you, you inevitably understand the history in a completely different way once you've talked to someone who lived through it. So, I mean, I will never forget we were working on a film on the second world war and some of the people we meet don't end up in the film for whatever right. variety of reasons. So we were trying to find some people who had been on D-Day in Omaha beach. And I remember going to visit the veteran and his daughter had contacted us. And this happened a lot on that project where family members would say, you should talk to my dad or my uncle. So we would go to their home. And I remember going into this man's kitchen and his daughter said, dad, dad, you know, Lynn is here. They're making the documentary and they want to hear about your time in the war. And he's saying, okay, okay. And I said, so, you know, after chit chat, whatever, just not talking about the weather. Then I, I sort of got to my point. So I, I understand you were on, D-Day. And he said, yes, I was in the engineer's battalion, which means they had to get out early to kind of take out the mines and blow up things that shouldn't be there. Incredibly dangerous job. Okay. So he said, so I'm sort of trying to understand what he's saying. And he said, I got out of the boat. And for me, D-Day, I always think, how do you get out of the boat? I mean, I would not be able to get out of the boat, but everyone's getting out. So you get out, even though you're getting fired on. He said, I got onto the beach, a shell came in and killed my best friend. And then he started to cry and then he didn't talk anymore. So he, he, and he, he, I had to leave. I mean, he couldn't actually speak. Well, uh, yeah. Understandable. Right. And, and his daughter sort of said he never talks about this and she had hoped that he would be able to, but he actually was so traumatized. Even 60 years later, he couldn't speak about it. And even though we didn't put him in our film because he, he couldn't really participate in that way. Spending that morning with him helped me appreciate in a very visceral way what we're asking people to do by reliving these really difficult moments and how hard that can be. Yeah. And the gratitude and humility you have to have because you just, you know, the generosity of someone to even try to do that is 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 sort of um, awe-inspiring. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing to talk about jazz and talk about my good times playing baseball, um, yeah, but right. it's another thing about like the Vietnam War you did, the Great War, World War II, um, and all these other like dark, dark mm-hmm. times in in American history. That's what I, I I I love what you and Ken do is that you really are historians of the American experiment. Mm-hmm. You know, you all. I mean, is there any? It's all American based, pretty much, if I'm not mistaken, right? Is there anything world based? I don't. Well, the Vietnam War is the first time for that in work that Ken and I have done together where we really tried to represent a story that was, you know, as Americans were interested in it, but the Vietnamese story was Side. as important to us. Right. right. So we tried very hard and I, I made a number of trips to Vietnam with Sarah Botstein, the producer, mm-hmm. to get to know Vietnamese people who had lived through the war and to hear their stories and hear how they talk about it and what it means right. to them which is very different than how we talk about it, what it means to us. <laughs> right. So, yeah, so that's the, that's the first time we've really ventured to another country, another culture to that degree so that the, the film hopefully really represented, you know, as best we could do, not right. just an American story. Right, exactly. Yeah, it wasn't a completely American point of view. It's like the oppressor and the oppressee. 
kind of mm. a vibe or, or no, that's not the proper word, but the, um, well, antagonist or whatever. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Antagonist. Antagonist. Yeah, right. Exactly. So you got the point of view because to us, to them, we're the, the bad guys to us. They were the bad guys. So- we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Like I always tell people, we're all, uh-huh. everybody is the hero of their own story. Nobody goes to sleep twiddling their mustache going, ah, ha, ha, I'm evil. No, everyone thinks that they're the good guy <laughs> in their right. own story, which is. And you're fascinating. right. And for Americans, the Vietnam War was the first time I think we really had to face as a culture. Maybe we're not the good guys. Or maybe yeah. we're not always the good guys. Right. And that was a reckoning that we still haven't really sorted out. I would oh say. no! Because after World War II, we're just like you know, we're we're G, we're super, we're Superman, we're you know, American Pie and baseball, uh-huh. and, and we saved the world, and and that, right. and we're still kind of on that high, in you know that PR, yeah. <laughs> that PR run yep. is still running. But I think from the the Desert Storm and all these other wars that we've gone into, people are like you know maybe maybe we're not always the the best guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, we try, we try, but like any human we do being, try. but the thing is yeah. like any human being, we have different, you know, we can't be perfect. <laughs> well, we're certainly not perfect. Yeah. <laughs> or, I think if we're perfect, it would be so boring. <laughs> right, exactly. We wouldn't even be sitting here talking because there would be nothing to tell. So I think it's especially hard for Americans though, to really examine our flaws and our failures. I do think culturally, like you said, we'd like to think of ourselves as the good guys and that we're always on the right side of history and that we, you know, stand for something that's good and, you know, inspiring and noble. And it's a lot more complicated. As, as a human being is like, you can't, it, like mm, there's so many right. layers, like, uh, as, as they say, uh, Shrek, like Shrek, you're like an onion, multiple layers, multiple layers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, the, the other thing I find fascinating about documentarian work is, and I've worked on documentaries in post, uh, mm-hmm. editing them, uh, mm-hmm. but nothing like a 90 minute, you know, documentary. So I have some ex- very small experience doing that, but the endurance that you need to have as a filmmaker to sit like some of these projects not only takes years i mean some are like did you do anything took like a decade or am i exaggerating well the national parks i think they really did work on for almost a decade and that allowed them to visit all those parks and film them at different seasons and accumulate all that material but but in fairness it's not the only thing that they were working on right so it's not your only project for 10 years but you know you might work on it a part of the time and, and work on something else that's shorter term and then come back to it depending on the it's, weather. It's, yeah, case. yeah, because I'm assuming you guys don't just sit down and just do like, okay, we're just doing jazz for the next three right. years. You've got four, five, six, eight different little, you know, some like a Hemingway over here and a, and a jazz over here and a Vietnam War over here yeah. and a Frank Lloyd Wright <laughs> over here. And you're kind of like dabbling in a bunch. It kind of keeps you all busy and sane. <laughs> mm, yeah. Well, I mean, Ken does work on, I think he says he's working on eight or nine projects right now. Right. And they're all at different stages of production. So he can be in editing room with one project and, you know, the film is being, let's say they're shooting interviews for another project and developing a script for another project. So using different parts of his brain for different aspects of that. For me, I like to work on maybe no more than two or three projects at a time. So my brain can't handle it. So, but that's enough. So, you know, Today I'm working on what two projects and tomorrow, but but like eight or ten, I don't know how Ken does it. Honestly, it's amazing. It's exact, but even two or three is like you know because as as narrative filmmakers, you generally are working on one, uh, and that one right. could take two years. You right. might be writing maybe something else, but I've I've been on projects that take two years, three years, and that's all you do all the time. It becomes kind of crazy, but the endurance is remarkable. Um, now, I have to ask you, what do you think the job of a documentarian is, in your mm, opinion? Wow. You know, documentary, in the time I've been working in this field, which is more than 30 years, it's really evolved. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and even the genre, such as it is, is so capacious. There's so many different kinds of documentaries and different approaches and different kind of philosophies. So, you know, it's almost hard to pin it down because different people approach it with different expectations. So I like to think that it's a way of putting on the screen. It doesn't have to be the big screen. It could be a small screen 
a true story, not based on a true story or inspired up by a true story, but an actually true story, something that really happened with real people. And that then, you know, that's the number one for me. Then is it going to be sort of a um, story of something that's happening right now? That would be sort of a, you know, present day story that you're following action as it happens Mm -hmm. or is it something that happened in the past like what we have mostly done although not exclusively where you're excavating a long ago story and trying to put the pieces together like you would a jigsaw puzzle Mm -hmm. you know figuring out what happened um hopefully it has a beginning middle and end (laughs) hopefully aristotelian poetics of just you know a story (laughs) that kind of makes sense in the way that we think of narrative Mm -hmm. which means you have to impose some kind of order and some kind of You know, right? You have to pick out the things that you think fit to get your beginning, middle, and end. You can have some detours along the way. But But ultimately, for me, it has to touch people. It has to have a human dimension and mean something to the people who watch it so that they are engaged and care about the story, the people, uh, the information that is true, you know, and that you come away with some new perspective or deeper understanding of some aspect of history, the human condition, what it means to be alive, you know, uh, those kind of things. The Because, you know, a, a human story, you know, history generally is not so neat as have a middle. It's not constructed in the middle, a, a beginning, middle, and end. A human life, exactly. I mean, yes, does have a beginning, middle, and end, but it could be very anticlimactic. It could be very mm. wide open. It could be multiple different things. So it's interesting how you, you are able to put together, you have to put a structure. Mm-hmm. There has to be some sort of, narrative story right. put into history, which is so much more complicated, I feel, than just writing one. I know I've seen in some of your other interviews that you're like, I, or you just said it here. It's like, I I, I can't do a, a fresh, come up with a story. I'm not that creative. Right. But, <laughs> but I, I'm going to give you more credit than you're giving yourself is to construct a narrative out of history. Yes, yeah, sometimes mm-hmm. it falls, but sometimes you just got to really work it and understand the structure of story so yeah. well, even more so than I think when you're creating it. That may be, uh, I, I've never tried the scripting <laughs> uh, adventure, so it, that seems like it would be harder and easier. Mm-hmm. For me, the, you know, I, I came to understand this in a deeper way when I was working on a documentary that I made uh, over the, a number of years called College Behind Bars, where we were filming not history, but life as it was happening. Right. And it was filmed over four years as we got to know people, Sarah Botstein, the producer, and I got to know people who were in prison who were enrolled in college, which is very unusual because most people in prison don't have access to college of any kind. And they were in this incredibly rigorous and impressive program called the Bard Prison Initiative in upstate New York. So, you know, we would come in and out of the facility multiple times a year with our cameras, sometimes without our cameras, other times, get to know people or hopefully earn their trust over time. And follow them around through classes, into the yard, into their cells, you know, meet their families and kind of understand. And the beginning, middle and end was basically you're enrolling in the program and hopefully four years from now there'll be graduation. So luckily school does have a beginning, middle and end, right? Right. So we knew, we hoped we'd begin with an, you know, an orientation and end with graduation. But along the way we had 400 hours of material of all kinds of things, you know, that, we didn't know how they would fit into our film or not. And you just, we kept filming. And a lot of the times we wanted to call the company seat of the pants productions because we just had, I felt we had no idea what we were doing, but if we sort of showed up enough, maybe it would all make sense later. And working with our editor, Trisha Reedy and assistant editor, Chase Horton, we eventually managed to kind of wrestle these 400 hours into four one hours where you really get to know people and see how they evolve and are transformed by the process of education and over time get to know why they're in prison and their families. And some of them came out of prison while we were filming, but at the beginning we had no idea. And we really did have to impose a structure on each scene and each episode and on the whole thing. There wasn't any structure. Right. And that's the thing that I feel that with, with the historical documentaries that you, uh, you do those, they're safer in a sense because you you know you're discovering your archival yes you'll have surprises and yes you'll have things but it's not going to hit you it's not going to blindside you whereas right. if you're following real life it's unfolding in front of you. you are on the edge you really have no right. idea and you might start the documentary and the story one way and then all of a sudden it just turns like uh, that wonderful documentary yeah. hoop hoop dreams 
back in the day. Yes, incredible. Oh, oh my God. Like, how did that, like, you know, it just, you're like, oh my God. Like, it, so something like that, you really, it's a completely different kind of documentarian, different kind of filmmaker to go down that yeah. road. So how did that feel jumping from, <laughs> from a very safe, historical, very yeah. long, <laughs> laborious, you know, process to, I'm on the edge. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Like you're like, yeah. like what's happening? It, How did that feel? Uh-huh. It, I mean, it's kind of exhilarating and terrifying, <laughs> you know, exhilarating in a sense of is exciting because you don't know what's going to happen right. and you sort of are open to whatever happens. We'll figure it out. But it's also certainly uh, scary to think, wow, what if, I mean, I had the feeling, okay, we started this film, but what if the department of corrections, which gave us incredible access or the students, the people in the film decided they didn't want to do it anymore. Right. That could have happened. Someone could have said, you know what, actually we're not doing this anymore for whatever reason right. that could have happened or, and things did happen. People got in trouble and was transferred to another facility and couldn't be in the program anymore or something happened in their personal life or, you know, academic things, whatever, just all kinds of things happen that you can't predict in life. But when you're trying to make a film, it, it can be very um, destabilizing. <laughs> you just have to stay open to that. But, you know, even with historical films, I mean, for the Vietnam War, it may seem like it made all sense when you see the final film. But at the beginning, it was a hodgepodge. we were not at all sure what the hell we're doing. Yeah, because, first of all, I've never been to Vietnam. I don't speak Vietnamese. Uh, we have to go. I want to go over there and meet people and figure out how to what questions to ask them right. and who to talk to. And how are we going to do that? And we've never really thought about the Vietnam War from the perspective of the Vietnamese. Get, turns out it's really complicated. So even just, and, and we, we wanted it to be from the ground up, ordinary people telling their stories. But then you have to figure out, well, if we're not going to interview John McCain and John Kerry and Henry Kissinger. We're going to talk to regular people. Which regular people? Right. So it was, you know, word of mouth and sort of going out into the world and trying to find people who fit certain criteria that we had of being in the anti-war movement or being on a college campus or being, um, you know, a soldier who then turned against the war. We had like different ideas of things or someone who covered the war, but we didn't really know what that would be. It all makes, if we do our job right at the end, it looks like it all fits in and makes sense, but it really doesn't at the beginning. And even at the middle, we're not too sure. Now with college behind bars, I, I, I wanted to, I wanted you to kind of express to the audience what it felt like, because I was, I was, I had the privilege of uh, doing location scouts for a film that I was going to direct oh. at every prison in Florida. Wow. So I went to every prison that would allow us to that wow. would allow us to shoot there if we wanted to shoot a film right. there. I got access to it, and I had never been in you know in prison. Um, I you know I'm, I was a boy from Florida, like I mean you know, I, I, I'm a good boy. I don't, I've never been in prison. So when you walk through those gates uh-huh. and you feel the energy. You know, we were in empty areas. We weren't with uh-huh. any, anywhere that was inmates. Though we did see, like, some of them were very uh, low, um, low security, uh, you right. know, low security areas. So that you, know, you see them walking and stuff. But I never was in a place where there was like, you know, you know, uh-huh. uh, Oz, as they said, the HBO show Oz or something like that. I wasn't in that. But the right. feeling of that place, the energy, the almost the ghosts, mm. if you will, of that place. Mm. Did you feel that? And you were going into a place with live, you know, people and yeah. interacting with people. Can you express to people about how that yeah. feels and how you put that onto the screen with College Behind Bars? Yeah, thank you for asking. You know, I, I do, um, I think it's important for all of us as citizens to try to have some proximity to the problem of criminal justice and incarceration in our society, which is horrendous and appalling. And it's it's not easy to get access if you're not don't have a family member that's caught up in this you know it's far away from most of us and it's behind walls and so i had never had the experience of being inside a prison until i got invited with sarah to give a lecture basically in this college program and that we went into the, we went through the you know the double gate and then the other double gate and then walking through the you know long hallway and kind of could see the yard over there and then down another hallway and then up a date you know i remember every step of this way into past an officer into a classroom, you know, it's, it's, it's an oppressive, dehumanizing, really just, um, degrading and 
oppressive environment. And it's meant to be that way. Nothing there is by accident. It's all by design. It's very um, purposeful. And especially probably too in Florida, but in New York State, um, the majority of prisoners are black and brown. The majority of the officers are white. The dynamics of how control is managed and security is done is, I found, extremely disturbing. Just, I I did feel, you know, uh, I just, I found it really, really upsetting and disturbing, to say the least. And yet, um, I also think it's easy for us if we have seen Oz or Locked Up or the other kind of Hollywood versions of incarceration to have a very skewed perception of what it's actually like. And one of the most profound things that one of the students that we've gotten to know really well said is that suicide is a much bigger problem than homicide inside prisons. Mm -hmm. It's about despair and loneliness and isolation and giving up hope and a place where there is no hope. And people, you know, decompensate in different ways in Mm -hmm. that environment. And so we have this image of this violence and, you know, awful things happening, but actually it's most, a lot of it is really designed to make people isolated and lonely and to not care. Yeah. I'll tell you, they, the, one of the officers that was our tour guide, he actually is like, do you want to go in one of the cells? And I went into one of the mm-hmm. cells and they shut the door behind me. Mm-hmm. And that sound, I'll never forget mm-hmm. the sound. I'll never forget the sound because I'm like, I'm play, I'm, I'm cosplaying this right now. This is, right. this is not real for me. But I can I can feel it. It is a a feeling, and you were like it was visceral. And I was Mm -hmm. a young man. I was in my mid twenties at that time. Mm -hmm. And boy, was it powerful. And I I I agree with you. I think if any if everybody could just feel that, I think our opinions of that whole system, honestly, needs to be needs to be readdressed in a very 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 big way. I agree. Well, that all this experience that we had and you know, we do we spent a fair amount of time inside people's cells with them and when you see the film, people who are the people that we got to know are college students. So their cells are full of books. Cool. So you're seeing American literature, art history, philosophy, economics, algebra, mandarin, you know, all the things they're studying, their their cells are full of books and they're doing serious academic work while in this very um, inhumane space. So there's kind of like a cognitive dissonance about that, but also a, it's extraordinarily inspiring to see that right. even in this dark place, they hold on to, and many of them have talked about this, just a sense of hope that there's something other than this place. And the way to move through it is to make sure you use your time the best you can and to, you know, open your mind in whatever way you can. Yeah, I would, I would, I would completely lose myself in in books. I would lo- I completely lose myself into that. I would escape mm-hmm. into that because that just makes the most, uh, the most sense, the most sense without question. Um, now you were talking about four hundred hours uh, for this project. Four hundred hours cut down to four hours. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've I've edited twenty five years, so I understand the process. I've never had four hundred hours of footage. So how do you, be, I mean, I'm assuming it's a team, yeah. it's not one person. <laughs> mm. Well, you know, in all honesty, because we're shooting digitally these days, yeah. the camera's rolling, especially if we're in a prison where you just, you know, yeah, you gotta just go. keep rolling because you never know. So there's a lot of that 400 hours, probably 50 hours that you don't even ever look at. That just is just like you're walking down the hall or whatever and you're not really, you know. But nonetheless, we filmed interviews, so we transcribe them and we pick out the best you know, moments from those. We filmed a lot of classes because it's a film about college. So in those, an hour long class might be five minutes. That's really interesting. So we sort of like whittled down from the beginning, what we'd say the highlights. And then we basically put them in a string out and watch it. And our string out was like nine hours long. So then it was just, that's not bad though. 400 to nine, you know? Yeah. Right. And in the scope of the projects you do, nine hours, Bad. Yeah, well, <laughs> we were planning to make a feature length doc, though, at the beginning. Exactly. So we had nine hours to boil down to 90 minutes, and I realized that's not going to be possible and make well, it would be possible, of course. But we just decided to go back to PBS and say, you know what, this material is so rich. And they actually had said at the beginning, you know, you might end up with something bigger than a feature because this is a very profound and, you know, rich story to tell and to get to know people and see what happens to them. So, um, you know, we 
it, 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 I have, our editors do an enormous amount of the time spent looking at the material over and over and getting to know it really, really well and picking out the things they think work best. And then we would react to that and kind of fine tune and hone with them. And we also brought in the people who were in the film. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, If they had been released from prison, especially to see it and kind of help us to get back to my point about being authentic, authenticity and being true, Mm -hmm. you know, they live this and we've got a version of it that we captured with our cameras, Right. but we didn't want to put something out that didn't feel authentic and true to them. Fair, Cause fair. You, you know, you have the camera on for a little while, you turn it off or you right. put, look over here, but something else happened that you didn't notice. And just, there's a lot of subtleties to what gets into, you know, gets captured on film or on whatever we capture things on nowadays. It's always going it, to, <laughs> it's, 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 it's like, it's, I need a Xerox. Like it's just yeah. film. Film is going to be film. <laughs> I need to film it or I need to tape it. You know, yeah, even, it. it's yeah. just the way it is. I, I just heard I heard a, a newscaster the other day say like, "Oh yeah, we were taping this." I'm like, you, <laughs> you, "They were on. It was on an iPhone. It was on an iPhone. Right. Come on." Yeah, but it's just, <laughs> it's just, it's part of the lexicon. Um, yeah. Now, tell me about your new project, Hemingway, which is a fascinating mm. subject. He is such a larger than life figure in American history, um, in the literary world. He is a giant up there with Mark Twain and Shakespeare. I mean, he is our Shakespeare in many ways, uh, give or take, uh, but he is yeah. a giant and he's so much information. I'm mean, like, even I, I've read a bunch of Hemingway, you know, growing up and, right. but, and, but the myth of who Hemingway is, is larger than life. It's a, as, as an art, like, I don't know much about Stephen King's personal life, though he is a giant in the literary world as well, different than Hemingway. But, you know, other than a few things, he, he's not, a, there's not a myth about him. No. There is a myth about Hemingway. How did you go to tackle this subject matter? Yeah. Well, the, you, you really hit the nail on the head there because Hemingway is unusual in the sense that he, the myth is sometimes bigger than him. And uh, I think many people that we talked to said it kind of gets in the way of actually seeing him. But he's so famous because of this myth. His work is extraordinary, as you said, but it's the myth that people know. And he created that. That didn't just happen to him. He was the reason why there's a myth. He very consciously created this persona and then kind of fed the flames of that throughout his life in very conscious and sort of uh, purposeful ways was he branding? Yes, exactly. <laughs> he was branding exactly. himself. He was he exactly. was an in, he was an influencer before there were influencers. <laughs> exactly. He understood all of that in a way that I think a lot of writers don't or wouldn't want to. More than like a movie star or a rock star, you know, he had a sense of his brand from a young age. It's fascinating, really. And that's Be- the story in and of itself. Yeah, before there was ever a concept of a brand, like a human being oh. being a brand, like, you know, Marilyn Monroe became a brand, but Marilyn oh. did not know about it when, you know, those big movie stars of the day did not think about that. But you're right. When you say rock star, or movie star, he essentially is the rock star or movie star of oh. the literary world. Yeah, I agree. And that's not necessarily the best thing for a writer, just to say, <laughs> you know, he's not playing arenas. You know, and he didn't like to be on the big screen. Right. So he's writing in his room on his typewriter. So but what he was famous for was kind of these escapades, you know, hunting and fishing. And you have there's I can't tell you how many pictures there are of him posed with the enormous fish he caught or the animal that he shot, you know, um, or in kind of like pretending to be boxing, you know, all these really macho sort of what we would now call hyper masculine poses. And even in his own lifetime, it got a little tired and there was criticism of it, you know, even then, even even then then, he was, he was at the extreme of this masculine persona. And he also kind of knew that, but I think he was trapped by it at a certain point. And it's true. He did enjoy the things that he was famous for doing, but having to perform the role of being Hemingway must've been 
exhausting. Very tiring. Yeah, exhausting. Yeah, exactly. Exhausting. Yeah, because once you build a myth like that, you've got to live up to it. Right. And, and it's a beast that you can't control. And that's the thing about brands and about your pers- your, your legend or your myth that you create. Mm. It, it, it goes off and you can't, if you build it to a point, it becomes its own monster. Uh, and I think it, I think the myth is the monster that ate Hemingway. Uh, I, unfortunately, I at the, unfortunately, at the end, it was too much for him. Yeah. I mean, it is a, it's a tragic story back to our hero's journey from Joseph Campbell there, you know, it's, there's hubris and there's just tragedy that happens to him and some things he's responsible for and some things he isn't. Uh, there's a family history of mental illness. And so, you know, you're born with that. That's a something you can't control. And the time when he was alive, certainly true now, but even more so then, there's such stigma around mental illness, depression, anxiety. No one talked about that. They would say somebody went for a rest cure or they're just taking a break or something. You know, you would rather, I don't know, I mean, the shame of going to a mental hospital you know, he didn't want that. And he was suffering from very serious psychotic depression, among other things, at the time that he did, should have gone to a mental hospital. Did he write any of his works while really going through some episodes? Um, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I can line up everything chronologically exactly, sure. but he also suffered from... Um, Alcoholism, chronic alcoholism, which oh, yeah. you know would have affect your power to Myth- mi- mythical, mythical alcoholism. I mean, yes, and he al- he glorified drinking, right? So, but then he, you know, it, it, that got the better of him. And then also, he suffered from a number of serious concussions, head injuries, over the course of his life, probably eight or nine very serious concussions, wow. which now we know that does really serious damage to your brain and your capacity to think and function and your moods and can cause depression and paranoia and all the horrible things we've seen happening with people who've suffered from um, traumatic brain injury and CTE. He had no idea about that. So he, you know, one of the psychiatrists who studied his trajectory suggests that he had a kind of a dementia, which is not like you don't know your name, but you, there's a kind of confusion and lack of capacity to really do organized thinking. And he really struggled with writing the last 10 years of his life. He had a lot of projects. He couldn't finish any of them. He couldn't figure out how to edit himself. He was just sort of overwhelmed with a lot of ideas, but nothing really gelling. And he did manage to write The Old Man in the Sea in the middle of all of that by some miracle. He had a few months of clarity, but before and after that, he was really a mess. That's, it, it's it's fascinating. What what was the one thing that you discovered about Hemingway that you did not know when you started this project mm-hmm. that surprised you? Well, I mean, a lot of things surprised me because I was not an expert when we started the project. So it's hard to say the one thing, but one of the more fascinating themes that emerged in the course of making the film was, and I, maybe I kind of vaguely had heard this, but I don't think I really understood it, that he, for this hyper-masculine guy who played the part of the, Macho the man, man who was the man's man, right, um, who was always strong and tough and didn't betray weakness and, you know, was courageous and morally right and all these things that he, you know, held such high esteem. He was vulnerable He was anxious. He was empathetic. He was concerned about how male behavior affected women. So he writes about that really beautifully in ways that I don't, I didn't fully understand in that, you know, we have this phrase now, toxic masculinity, which I I didn't have that in my vocabulary 10 years ago, but I understand what it is now. Hemingway could be the embodiment of that in his personal life, in his relationships with his wives and other women in his life. But in his work, at times and not always, he critiques that. So he writes a story called Hills Like White Elephants, where it's a man and woman at a train station. This is written in the 1920s. So it was quite, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, risky thing for him to do, but it was unusual in that it was about an abortion. The man (sighs) wants the woman to have an abortion. She doesn't want to. They never say the word abortion. He just keeps saying to her, it's just a simple operation. They just let the air in and then you'll be fine. We'll be just like we were before. 
I promise. It's just a little operation. And she's not sure. And he keeps at her and at her and at her. And when you read the story, you're not thinking, wow, what a great, strong, tough guy this is. You're thinking, this guy's a jerk. I don't care if you're a man or woman reading that story, your sympathy and your the hero where the moral center of the story is the woman. Mm -hmm. And at one point she just says to him, will you please, 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 please stop talking. And, you know, the Hemingway, the myth of Hemingway. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. You Shatters. wouldn't think he'd be capable of right, having the sensitivity to write that story in the way that he does. And that's, that's the beautiful duality with Hemingway is that he portrays this complete macho man, drink until you're, you fall over, then get up and smoke a cigar and write a, a masterpiece you know, right. while, while you're in, in the Keys or in Cuba <laughs> and then you're right. hanging out with Fidel and all this. Like all of the, that's the, the myth, but if once I, I did, I've seen parts of, uh, not all of it, because again, it's six hours uh, and I have children, uh, but the parts that I have seen that he, when he was younger, was dressed as a girl and his sister yeah. was dressed as a boy. And How about that? Through, the, through his life, he actually had his wives cut their hair short. And they would – this gender kind of thing that they he would – like he would play with. Yeah. There's, a, there's a sensitivity behind all of uh, all of that macho-ness. And I found that to be true with – I mean I've, I've spoken to many, many people in my life and have met many, many uh, interesting human beings in the entertainment industry. The more macho big they are, generally the more insecure, the more mm-hmm. um, scared – the more they lash mm-hmm. out because they they don't want to show any and they can't show any weakness because uh-huh. of something that happened in their childhood or something like that. It seems very similar to with Hemingway. He put this this shield up. I think it was almost a protective thing for him because yeah. he didn't want anybody to know who he really was. But it would slip through in his writing. He couldn't yeah. hold it back there. So that's really he's such an interesting character. I agree completely. And and you know that that what you just described is something I, I was sort of focused when we started the project on this kind of obnoxious myth and some beautiful writing that I loved. And I didn't understand the complexities of what you just described until I've gone all the way through the whole life. And you know, late in his life he he started to write more explicitly about his interest in gender fluidity and in gender role playing and in a kind of vulnerability in his intimate life. Um, He never published that during his lifetime, but his family has allowed some of this material to be published, especially in a novel called The Garden of Eden, which is not my favorite in terms of Hemingway, great work, but in terms of understanding Hemingway, the man, it's really fascinating. You see a a man, his wife is sort of uh, transitioning to male, I would say, in the story, and they bring in another woman into the relationship. So there's a polyamory component to this. The husband becomes kind of the female in bed with the her the wife who's more of the becoming more of the husband, and then this other woman. And I mean, it's very interesting and relatable to us today in a way that in his lifetime, I think, you know, would have he couldn't publish it. Let's put it that way. He didn't no, he could. right. I mean, it'd be interesting to see how. I mean, because and and there's that whole concept now, of the cancel culture. And, mm. you know, like, you know, oh, you can't say that, you can't do this, you can't do that. There's a lot of stuff in Hemingway that is uh, arguably, like, when's that When's that shoe going to drop? Any second now. When is, that, mm-hmm. is, when is someone going to go, oh, we can't, we got to pull out these books. I mean, Hemingway. Like, mm-hmm. Which, what do you think, I don't want to talk about cancel culture in general, but for, specifically with Hemingway, yeah. why do you think that he kind of transcends that? Because look, mm-hmm. there's stuff in, look, if they're, if they're knocking out, you know the the Swedish chef and uh, and um, uh, Dr. Seuss. I mean, Hemingway is a much easier target than Dr. Seuss is. Mm, so, what do you yeah. think makes his work kind of almost impenetrable to that kind of? Mm. You know, what makes him stand away from that? Yeah, you know, we'll see how it all plays out. <laughs> yeah. as we're still early. Having, right? We're still early. Right. And I'm glad we're having a conversation as a society about you know, reevaluating these icons of the past and looking at them honestly for who they really were and what they really said and what they say about us, good and bad. And I think that's healthy. 
And I'm not big on the Pantheon where you can only have so many people up on Mount Rushmore or, you know, it can only be four writers and you have to pick. I, I think we have room for a lot of people to be read and discussed and to whose voices matter. And it certainly shouldn't just be Hemingway by any means. But taking him out of the equation is a mistake, too, because he helps us understand some of the problems and challenges in his limitations as well as his strengths. Right. He uses incredibly offensive words. Uh, hurtful words. He there's anti-Semitism in his work that I personally find deeply offensive. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that I don't want to read the sun also rises. It means that when I do read the sun also rises, I'm going to be thinking about anti-Semitism in our culture and why did it exist? Does it still exist? Why would you know? What does it say about the people who read this book then and right. loved it? You know, it, it it it's in other words. It's it's part of our history that we have to face, like it or not. And there's also potentially a critique of those things in there too, if you want to look at it that way. I mean, look, you know, look at Mark Twain. I mean, you, look, you read Huck Finn. I mean, he's, he's saying some stuff that's probably not uh, the most PC stuff in the world nowadays. Mm -hmm. To listen, but I, I always find it, especially in history, and you, you're much more more of a historian than I am. But from my 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 limited perspective, is in history. It is a product of its time and has mm -hmm. to be looked through those that lens. If it's being brought into today's world, there's a conversation to go, you know what? What they said there isn't appropriate from our point of view there. Just right. like, and I promise you and everyone listening, in a hundred years, they're going to be looking at stuff that we're doing and going, yeah, you know, we really, the social media thing, not really the best idea. You know, sure. you know, polluting the entire planet and killing ourselves off, not uh, denying the global warming, not the smartest thing. So we're going to be judged as well. So I think it and just- And we should be. And we should be, right? right. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. And look, I mean, it's just because you brought him up. Shakespeare, there's racism, there's anti-Semitism, there's misogyny. <laughs> you know. Time. And we don't just say, well, we're not going to read Shakespeare or we aren't going to ignore those things. We're going to have that conversation, you know. It's a, and, it's a teaching tool. I feel it's a teaching right. tool more than anything. And yes. like with, with my daughters, with my daughters, as I'm watching things sometimes now, you know, things that I grew up with, mean, things I grew up with. I mean, I'm like, uh -huh. how, stuff, stuff I saw on TV, some episodes of Tom and Jerry, some Looney mm. Tunes episodes, which yeah. are straight up just racist, completely racist. Mm -hmm. Um, and we didn't think twice about it. And then my daughters will watch something and we'll, and they'll point out, what is that? And then there's oh. a conversation to be had about it. It's a teaching tool at this point in the game, but you can't sanitize it because right. when let's say a child is sanitized from all of that. And when they hit that, imagine getting hit with racism for the first time at 30. Yeah. You can't. It's a difficult, like the concept of racism. Like you've, yeah, you've been yeah. so sheltered. No, it's out there, right. You should I mean, really, yeah. you know, I do think with children's literature and children's books and children's media, it's maybe a little bit different criteria right. than for adults because we have the tools, hopefully, to kind of have that <laughs> critique and conversation. We're working on a film, Ken and Sarah Botstein and I, about America's response to the Holocaust. Oh, yeah. And it's about, about how, that. right? Yeah. So we're, and we're trying to understand anti-Semitism as a, factor of life in Germany. And we came across a book that the Nazis put out, a picture book about the horrible Jews and how they are, you know, subhuman and, you know, will destroy yeah. you and poison you. And there's beautiful illustrations, incredible, you know, with a devil. And I mean, if you were a kid reading that, you would just, it's captivating. So yeah. I kind of think, well, maybe for children's literature, we have to have different criteria because children don't have the framework. Or the you know, tools, yeah, or the I tools to process it. I would want my kids to read that, right, exactly. So I understand the impulse to remove some Dr. Zeus books because, and that was done by the estate. I mean, they decided they didn't want these books out there anymore. You know, The Cat in the Hat is still great. The, the Cat in the Hat is still great, yeah. And it's, 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 we're living in very interesting times. And I'm, as a documentarian, <laughs> I, I'm assuming you're looking around going, Jesus, I'm just pulled. There's so much I want to say right now. There's so many different projects I want to do. Uh, but out of all the projects you've done, which is the most difficult? Which is the one that was the longest, just even if it wasn't time wise, just <sighs> difficult to get through? Because you've tackled some tough subject matter. Mm. I, you know, I think truly the Vietnam War series and the College Behind Bars, which we were working on more or less at the same time, both were dealing with enormous tra traumatic experiences and tragedy 
And College Behind Bars was also an uplifting story of transformation, but there's tragedy and devastating human experience within it. Um, so, and the Vietnam War is just an unending tragedy. So spending the time to get to know people who are still carrying that loss and grief unprocessed and anger and rage and disillusionment, especially with our country, as we said before, sort of, you know, we weren't always the good guys and our leaders lied to us and let us down and told us we were there for one reason or other reasons or the reasons kept changing or said we were winning when we weren't or minimize casualties on all sides. Just the kind of the betrayal, I would say, of the American government. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Of the people by the government and the Vietnamese government, not a whole lot better, by the way. (laughs) So you just have epic tragedy on all sides. Kind of sitting with that for all those years was... um, Difficult to, t- I mean, day in, day out, yeah. that must have been, that must was, have been rough. It Emotionally, difficult. spiritually, it must have been rough. Yeah. And spending time with the people who were still carrying that weight and then, you know, watching the film as it evolved with some of the veterans that we got to know and some of the people who protested the war and still felt very raw about it. It was, it was really painful. Mm-hmm. I think, um, so that, that experience that sits with me. Uh, and there are some days both on both of those projects of especially filming interviews with people who shared extremely difficult stories and mm-hmm. really um, opened themselves up in ways that I have never experienced before was just a profound experience that I will never forget. No, I have to ask you, I, I, because this, I'm now, I just need to know your opinion. Okay. What, what do you feel about the rise of the docuseries, of, of Tiger King, of those kind of, you know, that's why I want to, yeah. I, I know you cringed right there for people not watching. She cringed. I want to know what a true documentarian who is, mm. you know, considered a very serious, award-winning, someone who's deadly serious about what you do um, for de- you know for decades now, there is a rise of docu series and some are really good. Some are, you know, Tiger King is just what it is. Um, I'm not specifically asking you to comment on specific ones unless you'd like to, but just in general, the whole rise of docu series because there are some docu series that are fascinating to watch. Absolutely. There's uh, absolutely I, we just which is the one I we just watched my wife was watching the one on the Menendez brothers and now that there's a whole movement to oh. free the Menendez brothers. And I'm like, are you like, there's a bunch of millennials that are like, free them. They were like, what is going on? <laughs> and watch that whole series. My wife and I were just like, are we, you know, or free Britney? Like that, you know, that whole thing. Yeah. That was a fascinating document. She's just sitting there going, again, and please, I, what you and Ken do yeah, are completely I'll, different. I'll, I'm just curious. I'll, I'll wait into this. I yes. mean, I, you know, I look, um, Sometimes I feel there's a very fine line between telling someone's story and exploiting them Mm. and sensationalizing them and actually using them and, you know, and sort of having the, it's really a reality TV kind of ethos in the documentary, uh, space clothing or whatever. Right. Cloak, cloak. And so the people are kind of performing, you know, outsized version of themselves like Hemingway did. Right. But you know, they're not, but they're on necessarily. camera. But they're on yeah, camera. they're on camera. So, but, you know, how much are they able to really have agency in that? Maybe a lot. You know, there's, it's just, it gets very complicated, I think, in terms of what is a documentary and what is kind of a performance. Now, everybody, when there's a camera on them, including me right now, we all perform to some degree. We're, you know, if I were just talking to you on the street, it would be a different conversation. We, we all know that, but if you are being filmed and you're sort of the more you act outrageous and the more you just play it up, the more you're going to be on screen, then, you know, that's what happens. So everybody gets it Mm -hmm. and everyone is part of that. So some, so anyway, I think some some of the, some some of of the series are in that mode, right. And Tiger King, I would say, I didn't watch the whole thing. I I heard it was great. It was the beginning of the pandemic. Entertaining Entertaining as heck. I thought great, totally entertaining. (laughs) But after a while, I just thought, where's this all going? I don't know if I really care in the end. So 
it, um, it was, it, it was, it was, it was a, I think the timing of that release, it was the beginning of the pandemic. That's right. why everyone was at home. Exactly. Everybody was like, what is this? I saw it come across my screen. I was like, right. what? Is, I saw the, and my wife was like, why are you watching this? And I'm like, because I, it's the pandemic and there's nothing, I got to watch this. And you it was, can't extre- away. You yeah. can't, it was, it was, but it was a train wreck. It was a train wreck and you were watching a train wreck. And that is very reality show style stuff. Right. Whereas in, you know, Oscar winning documentaries like uh, Searching for Sugar Man or, mm. uh, or The Wire, um, is it The Wire or the, yeah, the, 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 uh, the, the Wire is actually not a no, documentary, but it's no, 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 TV. great yeah, TV. No, no, the, the one about the guy who, um, who won the Oscar, oh, man, man, on, man, 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 man on a wire, man on a wire. You watch those yeah. kind of stories and you're just like, oh my God, that's like amazing storytelling. Um, I agree. But, but I, that, you know, yeah. I look, I mean, I, there, I think a docu-series is wonderful because it's like reading a novel or having an extended podcast where you really dive in and get to know people and a story from multiple perspectives and over time. So if you listen to Serial for eight hours, you get really sucked into who are these people and there's different ways to think about this. And, you know, if it's artfully done, it's totally captivating. And I, I'm really thrilled that these that there's a huge audience for this kind of storytelling and these kind of stories to be told. I just, when it gets into the sort of sensational, almost exploitation, exploitative realm, I get uncomfortable. So like making a murderer, I thought was fascinating. Right. You know, that was landmark docu series. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure in the end that they fully gave you all the information you needed. They sort of shielded certain parts of the story from the audience. So I think that is problematic. I loved OJ made in America. I thought that was one of the amazing. greatest. Amazing. Sheer brilliance. Yeah. Absolutely so, amazing. Yeah. It, it, but there's, but I think at the end that opens the appetite for other documentaries. And I think that's always right. a good thing, you know, so Tiger King probably brought in a generation or a bunch of audience to the concept of a docu series. And now they'll be more interested and might be watching you know, uh, one of your projects or college behind bars or something along those lines, because they associate, Oh, it's a, it's a docu-series. I could jump into that. And and just, I think it helps everybody. It does help everyone. Even though some of it might be more exploitive, it does open up hopefully the audience to other great documentaries. I agree. And to get back to what you said at the beginning, it's about real people, you know? So there's something absolutely fascinating about this is not an actor, right? an actual person doing their thing, whatever it is. This is not somebody wearing a costume. Right. Or a superhero's outfit or a giant lizard fighting or a robot. Outfit, <laughs> or a giant I lizard fighting a robot. But yeah, <laughs> there's something that's absolutely fascinating for us as human beings to be a eavesdrop on somebody else's life. What's a voyeuristic? Way. Is that voyeuristic thing that, you know, why voyeurism is such a powerful thing? Mm-hmm. I mean, Hitchcock knew that extremely well. For your window, and, I was just thinking. Yeah, it was, exactly. It was like extremely well. And we're all fascinated. Like, who's, what, what's going on behind that closed door over there? <laughs> What's going exactly. on? And that's what documentaries do. They peek you through the door. Like you're like in Hemingway, you're seeing things that were not yeah. made public, you know, and you're seeing yeah. things behind the scenes that are really, you know, almost voyeuristic in, in a way. Uh, I, I had one other question for you in regards to, because the kind of, the kind of documentary you are is you tell the story, you tell the truth, you put it all out there. Uh, but there are uh, documentarians and filmmakers who put themselves in the story. They're oh. the guide. They're the narrator. The supersize me. The, uh, right. the Michael Moore. The Michael Moore is very famously mm-hmm. who put themselves in the documentary. How do you? What do you feel about those kind of stories and that kind of? I mean, just not specifically yeah. those filmmakers, but just it's a different kind of documentary. Yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, I think in a way it's very honest because then you know who's telling you this story. Right. Here's the guy or the woman whose story this is. There's no kind of objective anonymous, invisible force of story, God, whatever it's, here's the person who, you know, Michael Moore is going to walk you around and tell you what it is. And I think if it works, it can be really powerful. I actually admire filmmakers for being brave enough to put themselves in and, you know, be in front of the camera. I hate to do that. My, my partner is, um, a psychiatrist. His name is Ken Rosenberg and he's also a documentary filmmaker. And he, when I first met him, which was five years ago, he said, I'm working on a film and it's about serious mental illness in, in America. And he, he, um, he filmed at the L.A., um, the emergency room in L.A. for over a number of years and people who were in psychotic states and then followed them over time. Wow. And as he was working on the film, he realized he, he needed to put himself in it, which is why. So he ended up basically narrating it and being on camera talking about his own story 
of his sister's descent into schizophrenia and how she died and how he'd been carrying this burden as a doctor who couldn't help his own sister and how many families suffered. So, and he very consciously chose to use himself and his story to kind of ground the film. And so then, you know, well, who's telling me this story and why should I care? And it was, you know, he didn't start out wanting to do that, but it was a really powerful device. It was also helpful for him to exercise his own demons and tell the story. The film is called Bedlam. And okay. um, he, he got a DuPont last year. I'm very proud of him. That's awesome. But it's, it's, yeah. So, but it was a really good example of the power of the on-camera filmmaker being inside the story and helping you, guide you through it. And also being really transparent about why this story is even being told in the first place. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So it can really work well. Yeah, and it's it's a way to connect the audience to the subject matter sometimes uh, because some things like jazz or baseball, you don't need someone walking you through it. It's I not it'd be weird. Yeah. It'd be weird like, hey, hi, how you doing? I'm Alex and we're going <laughs> to back in the day. Like that's just like it seems very kind of kitschy and it doesn't really like right. something you would see on Sunday at like three o'clock on <laughs> on like your not yeah. even local public access. It would just be like it's just a weird thing. Um, but certain topics like Super Size Me was all about him going through the process. He's the subject right. of, the, you know, which was I mean, I mean, he literally changed McDonald's. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like it was remarkable that that whole world. Um, and I have a couple questions I want to I, I ask all my guests. Um, okay. What advice would you give a documentarian wanting to break into the film business and into the business of making documentaries today? I'm of two minds. Um, let's explore. That. Let's expl- let's explore yes. both minds. Okay. <laughs> you know, I think you know. Be sure you're passionate about the story you want to tell. And why you want to tell it and really drill down on that, why you care about it and what you can say that hasn't been said. Mm -hmm. And then most important, how will it affect the people who you're going to be filming, which is sort of back to our Tiger King point. You know, is this going to be something that will your subjects will be okay with when it's over? And I'm not talking about expose of, you know, corporate malfeasance. If you want to make a documentary about Purdue Pharma and the Sacklers, go for it. (laughs) <laughs> they deserve whatever bad things can happen to them as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> right. But if you're talking about ordinary people and you're going to write, so, but if you're going to film just your neighbor and their relationship with their dog or something like the truffle hunters, let's say, right. you know, and if you saw that, right. Yeah. So is this, why are you doing it? And what are you trying to say? And is it honorable? I think okay. I, I, to our larger point, but if you're passionate and you have a story that you think needs to be told, then you should go for it. And it's so, so affordable to do it nowadays. I mean, the cameras are right. super expensive. It's super inexpensive. I mean, before you had to get the film camera and the the, the, the yeah. flatbed and all that stuff. I'm assuming you guys shot some film we back did. in the day and cut it on flatbed. And, you oh, bet. Oh, uh-huh. God. I rem- the, the four guys who repaired the Steenbecks went out of business about 20 years ago. But yes. Yes. The <laughs> infrastructure of that world. So, you know, yeah, I think the mode of production is much cheaper and more available and more democratized. You can film it on your iPhone. You can cut it on your laptop. You can put it out on YouTube, you know, so the, the barrier to entry is zero. So it's more just, is the story worth telling? Is it really important? Is it going to be worth you spending X amount of time of your life to tell this story? Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Mm, wow. <laughs> That's such a profound question. I'm not sure <laughs> I can answer it. Uh, a few things come to mind. Um, it took me the longest to learn. I've learned a lot of lessons. So, <laughs> I, you know, pop this, I don't know if it took me the longest to learn, but it's something I, I hold on to is how important it is to just be present. Mm. And especially now it's so hard because <clears throat> we're so distracted. I All haven't right. looked at my phone the entire time we've been talking. And that's maybe a record, you know, for today. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> to really, it's- but that's, you know, I'm here with you. I'm not doing anything else. And that's right. great. We've had a great conversation. And I think we lose that so easily. It's just, you know, yeah. how often have I been doing something and I get distracted and then I'm lost and then I don't come back to where I was. And so trying, staying focused and being present and just letting things happen because you are present is really, really important. And I think it's, it takes a lot of discipline to do that, especially now. It's really, really hard. 
And three of your favorite films or documentaries of all time. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, films of all time, I would have The Godfather way up there on high on the list. Yes, yes. Which, you know, I, I don't know. That's a Desert Island movie. I could watch it over and over again. Sure. So there's there's a few others. I've, I've just, uh, documentaries. <clears throat> there's so many. I don't know. That's really hard to say. Wish I had prepared for that. I have a list. <laughs> what comes um, to what comes to the, to the top of your head at yeah. the moment? Well, interestingly, on the Francis Ford Coppola sort of genre, The Hearts of Darkness, oh. about is such a right. It's Eleanor Ele- Eleanor uh, uh, Coppola, uh, his yeah. wife did that. Oh my God! What an amazing documentary! An amazing documentary. It's about the making of Apocalypse Now. For anyone who doesn't know, and Apocalypse Now is kind of a flawed film, but has moments of brilliance in it. And her telling of how challenging that was. I I wasn't a filmmaker when I saw it, but it really stuck with me. Um, Eyes on the Prize, which was a series on PBS in the 80s about the civil rights movement, had a huge, profound impression on me because it was the first time I'd seen that kind of storytelling of just regular people who were witnesses and participants in history telling their stories. It's such an important historic experiences of our country that I had read about in books, but I did not understand. And seeing Eyes on the Prize brought that epic time in our history vividly to life in just indelible ways. So that's way up there on the list for me. Well, Lynn, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you, uh, all things documentary. And uh, I, I tell everybody out there to please go watch Hemingway and all of your films, honestly. Uh, I mean, if, you, if you've got like a year or two uh, to, put, <laughs> to, uh, to put away, because it's going to take you a minute to watch it all. That's <laughs> but, true. <laughs> how many hours have you, like, I read somewhere like 80 hours or something like that? If you've something produced? like that, but it's been 30 years. Right. So, you know. so I mean, yeah. it's not like you just so, did that last week. I mean, it is right. what it is. But uh, but thank like you so, but thank you so much for doing what you do and fighting the good fight as a documentarian and telling the truth out there and helping get a little bit better clarity on your subject matter. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Alex. It was a great conversation. I really want to thank Lynn for coming on the show and dropping her knowledge bombs on the tribe today. Thank you so so much, Lynn. I would recommend that everybody listening head out and watch Hemingway on PBS. And you could also watch it on PBS's channel on Amazon Prime. Now, if you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 469. Thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E dot com. 